Welcome back, everyone. In recent weeks, we have had Q3 updates from both Cameco and Kazataprom, and so I thought, even though there wasn't that much new information in what was said in the third at the end of the third quarter, I figured I would do a little uranium update because people seem to like that. So I figured I would start with the Cameco conference call and address a few points there before going to Kazatomprom and then a few other things in general. On the Cameco conference call, I was there and I was not blown away by the amount of new information. As I said, there was some very interesting lessons. And for those of you who may not be, may not have been around the uranium market for that long or are interested in uh, a little color on contracting and on market, off market. There was very interesting things for some there. However, new information, not too much. Um, but they did sound mostly bullish, except for uh, a bit at the end where they pointed out that it is still a buyer's market for now. But I'll get into some of the bullish things that they were that they said, particularly Grant Isaac, who in fairness, has a history of sounding like you could hear the bullishness in his voice, but some of the things he said were interesting. I'll get to that. Now, obviously, um, and a few people were pointed this out after I commented that I thought that they sounded decently bullish. People asked, well, why did the stock sell off? And honestly, I don't know. I don't pay that close attention to the uh, I mean, I hadn't looked at the price of Cameco in a while before the call, honestly. I looked after because people were saying that. I don't know. Is it, are people, is it investor fatigue? I mean, they did miss earnings by, what, 16 cents? Um, so maybe people didn't like that they missed. Who knows why the stock sold off on one day? I, like, maybe people didn't like what they were the the sound of what they were saying about uh the cra maybe appeal but i mean that wasn't news anyway i don't know stock went down but that's not you know one day move on it could be anything so i'll start with a few things that tim gitzel said which again aren't really new but kind of point out how far we've come in the cycle and there was, of course, the prepared speech and all that stuff. But one of the things that kind of struck me as a, not a milestone, but a, okay, you know, continued uh, showing how much that they've done, is he said that they've taken 87 million pounds off the market. So that's production that they would have had that they did not have. And at the same time, he said that they've bought 50 million pounds. And that's a lot. And not only is that a lot, but he mentioned, or it was mentioned on the call and uh, was obvious beforehand, they're not done purchasing. As long as MacArthur River stays offline, and that has nothing to do with the disruption seen this year, as long as that remains offline, they will be continuing to purchase. And they will not bring it back online until they have sufficient homes for all those pounds. Well, most enough of enough of those pounds. Now, Grant Isaac, who again always, well, I mean, at least recently in recent quarters has seemed uh, rather bullish. A few of the things he said again sounded quite bullish and were uh, borderline um, enthusiastic, if you will. Um, he spoke about the strong fundamentals, and I mean that's not new for Cameco. They've talked about strong fundamentals in the past and things, uh, you know, the market needs to transition. But he kind of mentioned at one point that, because um, they were talking about the incentive price or the uh, trade tech cost of, um, cost of, full cost of pounds. And he was saying that basically Cameco wasn't in a hurry to lock in prices in the 40s, um, high 40s, because They've seen in the past, they've seen this movie before, and I'm trying to uh, say it in the exhausted tone that they uh, mentioned this, that we've seen this movie before. When the price moves in uranium, and they 
pointed to 2006 and they pointed to 2010. When the price moves, it has in the past overshoot, and they even said dramatically overshoot. Now, I don't generally like to uh, suggest that will happen or promise anything like that, but when an executive at Cameco uh, mentions that they think that, well, in the past and when uranium moves that the price will dramatically overshoot, I think it's a little bullish. I mean, it sounds bullish. Who knows if they're trying to job on the market or not or what, but that's one thing to mention. Another thing that Grant Isaac mentioned after Tim Gitzel mentioned that uh, Ranger and Kamenak were closing well, uh, early next year, Q1 next year, mostly, or first half, at least, for Common Act. Um, they're closing. And later, Mr. Isaac uh, mentioned that they those are some of the sources for some of the pounds that are undisciplinedly, that's not a word, but you know what I mean, hitting the spot market. So those are the sources for some of the pounds. And one thing that is uh, particularly interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later maybe, is that Commonac, that is owned by Arano. So the pounds from Commonac, um, whether it's those pounds or some other Arano pounds that are hitting the market, once that closes, those are pounds that will probably be needed for other contracts. So it is a direct, hit with those pounds to the availability on the spot market. And the other thing that was mentioned in the call um, a number of times actually is that off-market uh, prospective business pipeline is heating up. Now it did sound like it cooled off um, a few quarters ago um, either due to the uh, global pandemic or something along those lines but they made it sound like it is heating up. And uh, so again, it's not even, it's not like you're gonna add 1 million pounds per quarter. It's no, it's zero, then five, then zero, then, but like the prospective business is heating up. And so that is, again, they said a historical precursor, precursor to the move in a changing market. Now, a little bit more on why is it relevant that the pounds hitting the spot market, particularly, are drying up, almost literally. Um, and so this is because when you look at the uranium market, most of the volume is contracted, long-term contracts. And so the spot day-to-day -day market doesn't matter much. I mean, the price matters, it's referenced in a lot of contracts, but the volume is not really a real market. There's a lot of, and, and add to that, half of the volume that is on the spot market, and this is what they mentioned in the call, probably approximately half, but half of it is trader churn. So I trade it to you, you trade it to me, I trade it to you, same pounds over and over. So when you have pounds that were gonna go into the spot market, let's say common act pounds for, for a rano, um, they would be selling their excess, uh, like what they more what more they produced than what they contracted. They'd be selling out in the spot market. Well, now they don't have as much pounds to go in the spot market, so they're they can't sell it, and then the trader doesn't have those pounds to churn around. So realistically, like let's say even. The volume, I say limited volume, in depending on the year, it could be 50 million pounds, okay? Um, if we assume that like 25 of that's leaving, and then we could, you know, say, well, Ranger, Common Act, that could be five plus, depends on how much of that's hitting the market, how much is contracted, but so, we're getting into a significant change in the spot market, and that is in January, then I believe March, the, the dates of the two mines closing with um, nothing, I mean, aside from one mine in Russia that's fully contracted, nothing um, really starting up. Now, um, because Adam Prom, they didn't have a full quarterly thing, they just had a update, and what they said, well, as expected, production was down 
significantly year over year because of the safety measures that they implemented. They're also saying they're buying small materials in the spot market and that should continue in Q4 and probably into next year. And the unfortunate part and the one thing I was hoping for that they would provide in an update, but they didn't, is updated guidance for next year because there should be an impact to production. However, they have seemed to either mix that into this year's late, late this year's guidance or merge the numbers somewhere. They haven't addressed it. They haven't changed their guidance for next year. And that, well, I mean, that doesn't uh, go in line with some of the, the things that they've said and that it could take four to nine months to um, impact is delayed four to nine months which firmly takes us into part of next year so that's the one thing i was hoping for and they disappointed me but you know we'll see when we get there at this point um it is what it is and unless there's another disruption which by the way i mentioned this a while ago um the cases in saskatchewan for example are at new highs and I'm not sure, in fact, I don't think that there will be another shutdown. There may be, and I would gladly be wrong, aside from I hope no one gets the, you know, no one gets sick, but I don't, I, I'd gladly be wrong that people are too cautious here, but I don't think it's going to happen. There's a number of little reasons, but it's just overall uh, it seems like people are losing their patience with the complete economic shutdown from that. Now, if one mind wants to shut down and be overly cautious, great, literally great, but I don't think it's going to happen. And so they mentioned that if there is a shutdown, that could further impact. But aside from that, um, they're back to heading towards full operations, well, full up, full reduced operations, but yeah, so that was my what i had to say on his adam problems update uh aside from that they did and this was beforehand well beforehand a few months ago actually and should be surprised to no one they reduced their 2022 guidance because the price hasn't moved and while models didn't um, incorporate that many models that you see it was fairly obvious now, also along the lines of stuff that was in some models and fairly recent news, Olympic Dam does not look like it was will be getting the expansion, at least in the near term. And when I say near term, I mean half a decade. So it's unlikely to be an impact on this cycle in uranium um, in that Olympic Dam, huge copper mine, copper focus, uranium is a byproduct. The expansion was debatable and questionable, but for uranium, it, in this cycle at least, does not look like it's happening. And that is good news, um, fairly big news in the in for the, the middle of the cycle, I mean, the, like uh, the middle of the next decade, I guess. And so it means that one, maybe two more projects will need to come online depending on the size of the project, but um, it's positive. And well, or there's positive. Unfortunately, there's also some negative. Now, it was announced a few weeks or months ago now, I don't know, time just blurs together this year, um, that Uzbekistan was is producing more uranium than what was estimated by the WNA. Now, is this enough to blow up the bull thesis? Not even close. But is it an amount that can delay things um, by a few months? Yes, and um, that I put that in my model was not greatest day, but I mean, this was always a risk because Uzbekistan has never publicly um, stated, oh, we're mining this much uranium. And so it was mainly an estimate. And now at least we have visibility on how much they're producing. Unfortunately, it was more than we thought. So could delay, I mean, is delaying a little bit, but um, now we know.
And the other thing, and this is not necessarily a negative, could be a positive, maybe not. Uh, Navoy Mining is going public. Now, this was announced last year or the year before. I don't know. It was many, many months ago. It's not new, but they've been talked. They talked about it again, which means that it's probably still the plan. Now, uh, we'll see if and when and if this uh, hits the market, how it impacts it. Again, it's it's much smaller than Casadam Prom, but it's still a decent sized global produce, producer. So does this mean that we are just news hit the tape and back to the endless wait of waiting for price? And I don't know, maybe. Um, the one thing I will mention is yesterday, November 5th, I bought a little bit of physical and Uranium Participation Corp. Why did I do that? Um, well, it's trading at a 20% discount to its book value. And so the price has also, um, looks like it may have um, stopped going down. Now, does that mean it'll go up? No. Does it mean it actually stopped going down? No, uh, maybe not. Uh, so I bought its 20% discount to NAV. It's basically as cheap as it was during the crash relative to NAV. And they have added, they have shown the ability to add some value via the discount. So it's one of the few ways, now again, not as levered, not as much of a crazy return potential as equities if the price spikes, but if the price kind of levels out, um, we could see, I think we could see the discount to the NAV uh, start to decrease. And so I'm thinking that even if it flattens or if it maybe ticks, continues to tick up a little bit, maybe uh, maybe it goes to 31, maybe 32 in the nearer midterm, we could see the uh, UPC start stop pricing in. Oh my God, the price is falling and start pricing in. Ah, maybe this is actually the right price. And that's a, you know, 25% on the upside. It's not nothing. So it's just a way of... And, uh, kind of anti-fragile way to play the near-term in uranium. And I really, the time is, is um, not running out, but getting there. And um, again, the still, who knows if this works tomorrow or next year or whatever, but I just don't think that, I think that it's very skewed towards the upside from here versus the downside. Now, a question that I feel like I've received, and if I haven't, thought about it um, or have seen it is what happened to seasonality and this is a good question um, I'm not exactly sure what happened to seasonality I'm mean, most years you look at by October there is a seasonal sw upswing in uranium now normally this is coincides with the WNA uh, symposium and so this year there has not been one um, so less meetings and less discussing and less contract discussion. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's the economic uncertainty around uh, tightening budgets and, oh, we still have a little bit of uh, inventory on our balance sheet. We could draw that down. We could always replace it later. It's not a big deal. It's a very, very uncertain time. And so whatever the reason, it did not show up on schedule. It did not show up as uh anticipated and maybe that maybe it means it's delayed maybe we'll skip a year i mean i i that would be bullish uh but I, it, the price has been trickling in the right direction i mean over years really and uh yeah i'll get to that in a second but the point i want to make first is that until whatever happens the supply discipline continues. Like I said with when I was talking about Kazadam Prom, if the price doesn't move, well, then we're going to see 2023 uh, guidance reduced. And then 2024, I'm just saying, whatever changes in the market are expected by supply coming back, that's not happening. And so the gap gets bigger and bigger. And how long will it take exactly? I don't know. Um, should it have already started correcting quicker than it has been? I believe so. Um, but does that mean that tomorrow it's going to jump up 50 bucks? 
No, obviously not. I mean, we have to look at what is the next thing and what will be the thing that finally stops the underbuying and stops the uh, utilities from running down inventory, running down inventory, and r being comfortable with less forward coverage. And again, when I say uh, underbuying, I mean, this is really the in the problem of the market, and it will continue to be as long as the price is low. And don't ask me how I know that, because it's uh, a certain, I mean, not certainty, but a uh, it's how it works. If the price is low, it means there's not enough demand, not enough uranium being produced, because that is the situation we're in. Versus if the price goes up, it means that there's people that want uranium that is not currently being supplied. So that's what causes the price to go up. But back to what I was talking about in the waiting until whatever, I feel like a lot of people are still thinking that the bull market is going to happen in a single day. And while things do tend to happen very, very quickly in today's market, I don't think that that is a reasonable assumption to think that it's going to happen quickly. And obviously, obviously, I'm exaggerating by saying a day, but it's not going to be in a month. It's how do I know this? Because if you look at the last two years or so of uranium, the price has been slowly moving higher. Now, has it moved high enough to cause changes, significant changes in the market? No, which is why it must go higher. Um, and so fundamentally, we're still in a very bullish scenario in that more time is very bullish. Now, eventually, eventually, the price will get to a point where more time will be bearish, but we're not there yet. And uh, so that is um, what is happening now. And it, look, a lot of things over the past two years, a lot of things have happened. A lot of things must continue to happen because the price is not going to the moon while there's existing mines that are shut down. Now, will the price go to the moon eventually? Who knows? Probably not. But some people's definition of moon is not others. But either way, you have to get past all of the things that are shut down in order to get to the, oh, we're going to need new. And that's another thing that popped up on the Cameco conference call. They called it an incumbent recovery, meaning that people, the mines that already exist, the producers that already exist w should be the first to benefit. And I agree. However, that doesn't really address the question of leverage to price because the existing producers have often much less leverage to price. And so that gets in the whole rabbit hole of, okay, if the price goes from 30 to 50, how much does it benefit X versus how much does the 50 to 60 benefit Y? Whole big rabbit hole, not the place for that. But either way, for now, we're moving slowly, but bullishly. So in conclusion, even though there hasn't been that much new information recently, there hasn't been that many headline things, this, that, the other thing that moved the price, nothing has really fundamentally changed. The what's going to happen will happen. It will happen on its own time. And it's a highly probable within reason to predict how this is going to play out. Now, towards the when, that's a significant question towards the the end part. That's another significant question. But the playing out of this cycle of the price when it will move is not really a big uh, question at this point. I mean, there's some minor things that add a little bit, subtract a little bit. But at this point, most of the impacts for the next few years are already in motion. And so while following, and this is a big, big thing for, for, for me and for others, is that following is helpful. Fixating is often harmful. If you're thinking, why isn't the price moving today, tomorrow, this week, it's not really helping.
best thing is if you are convinced of or if you're pretty sure of what's going to happen position and if you know if there's a sale you can add but find the next thing also just it it doesn't help to stare at the numbers that you have on your spreadsheet every day it doesn't help and so i will continue to cover uranium um here and there and when there's something relevant or just general updates as i did here mostly but don't want to have anyone or have me fixating on what's going to happen when specifically aggressively trying to figure it out so with that i hope you enjoyed today's video thank you all for watching to this point hope you liked hope you enjoyed and until next time, have a great day.